would like to tell you today two stories from my laboratory, from the laboratory I'm working with under this topic. This is how we operate this one? Yes, okay. So, <laughs> I'm working with the Elinav lab at the Weizmann Institute, which you can see here to the right. And our lab deals with host microbiota interactions, and we want to understand how they, the mechanism that can explain these interactions in various uh, conditions of human health, inflammatory bowel diseases, our response to infections, tumorogenesis, circadian rhythmicity, and of course, metabolic syndrome. And the two stories I would tell you today are related to metabolic syndrome. So when we talk about metabolic syndrome, of course, our main goal is to keep people in normal body weight, normal blood glucose, and we want to prevent weight gain and increase in blood glucose. And I think that I will not surprise you with the next slide I'm going to show, and you don't need information from the NIH uh, when I tell you that weight loss diets are inefficient in the long term. So you can see here this uh, research uh, published by the NIH that uh, they used various types of weight loss diets, and by the end of the treatment, indeed, the participants lost weight. When they continued to monitor these participants after one year and after five years, uh, after the experiment was done, the people just regained their original uh, body weight. So this is a good point to ask ourselves, maybe we're doing something wrong when it comes to weight loss diets. And we can consider uh, a few of the strategies that are employed by physicians, by diet dietitians, uh, to prevent weight gain or to prevent uh, increase in blood glucose. And Probably one of the most common advice that you will get if you will go to your doctor and say, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to become diabetic, I want to lose weight. You will say, okay, so cut down on your uh, sugar intake and cut down on your calories, uh, reduce the calories that you consume. Um, and then you will say, but I like uh, sweet things, I don't want to just stop eating sweet things. And then the dietitian will say, okay, so continue to eat sweet stuff, but reduce the calories. So how do you do that? You just consume non-caloric sweeteners, and these non-caloric sweeteners, they can be artificial, they can be natural, and they can be found basically in every product that we consume. And uh, this advice uh, is um, widely endorsed by physicians, by clinicians. This statement from 2012 was published in the home journals of the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association. If you want to maintain normal body weight, if you want to maintain normal blood glucose, if you want to prevent an increase in both, just replace caloric sweeteners with non-caloric sweeteners. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we keep hearing for the last decade or so, if you open just uh, popular media, newspapers, television, we can see, oh, sorry, and just I wanted to say before that, uh, that this advice is also highly um, uh, taken uh, seriously by the public, and we can see this is data from the US. We can see indeed, how do you turn on the pointer like this? Like this, excellent, okay. So we can see that indeed there's a significant in increase in consumption of non-caloric beverages uh, throughout the years. About 86% of Americans use diet products and spend quite a lot of money on such products. Uh, nevertheless, as I just began to say earlier, um, we keep hearing uh, in newspapers and in television uh, headlines like this, can sugar substitutes actually make you fat? Artificial sweeteners could lead to obesity and diabetes. Diet soda uh, can cause weight gain and deadly diseases. And diet soda may be worse for you than regular soda. So it seems like the popular media is trying to tell us that there is a counterintuitive effect. You consume something that is diet and you actually become obese, you actually become diabetic. This is really counterintuitive. And you can say, well, we expect that from popular media. Popular media will say whatever uh, they have to sell to sell newspapers. But actually, uh, these uh, headlines are based on actual studies, uh, serious studies performed in large cohorts of humans, and they were quite nicely summarized in this review from 2013, that artificial sweeteners produce the counterintuitive effect of inducing metabolic derangements. So you can ask yourselves, okay, so if these headlines are actually true, there are actual studies that demonstrate uh, this uh, claim, how can it be that I just showed you that uh, heart uh, uh, doctors and diabetes doctors actually support the consumption of artificial sweeteners? And the problem 
or the caveat for these studies is these epidemiological studies suffer from the chicken and the egg uh, question or sort of a reverse causality uh, question. We really do not know in all of these studies whether these people actually became obese or diabetic because they consumed artificial sweeteners or it's just the other way around. These people want to uh, maintain their body weight and they want to maintain normal blood glucose, so they consume artificial sweeteners. So this is where we started uh, the first uh, story that I want to share with you today um, about how artificial sweeteners may or may not uh, cause uh, obesity or diabetes. And our first experiment was in mice. It was very, very straightforward. I went to the supermarket. I purchased artificial sweeteners uh, that contain the most three common artificial sweeteners today, either based on saccharin, aspartame, or sucralose. We added these to the drinking water of mice. You can see here, we followed them at the for the first experiment for a duration of 11 weeks. And uh, maybe you do not know this, but if you uh, buy in the supermarket these packets of uh, saccharin, sucralose, or aspartame. Actually, most of the volume is glucose, and only about 5% is the non-caloric artificial sweetener. So our best control was mice that were just drinking the same amount of just glucose without the added artificial sweetener. We also had, mi we also had mice that were drinking caloric sweetener, sucrose, or mice that were just drinking water. And the first thing that we've done after 11 weeks of this uh, supplementary to the diet is to perform an oral glucose tolerance test. You can see that all of, all of our control groups uh, responded similarly to the bolus of glucose, whereas all the mice that received either saccharin, sucralose, or aspartame in their drinking water had a worse glycemic response. That is, these mice demonstrated glucose intolerance. And we repeated this experiment in a variety of doses, uh, diets, uh, pure form of the sweetener, and this kept uh, ver uh, different mouse strains, and this kept repeating itself over and over. So uh, the first thing that we've done uh, after this is to ask what is causing this uh, glucose intolerance. We consume these artificial sweeteners, and we know for maybe a century now that these uh, substances are so-called metabolically inert. Um, uh, they go out as they come in, with the exception of aspartame. Um, and then we ask ourselves, okay, if the host does not metabolize these uh, com compounds, maybe the microbiota interacts with these compounds. So the first thing that you can do if you want to um, address the role of the microbiota is just to kill the bugs, give antibiotics to the mice. And we gave two regimes of, uh, of antibiotics, one that targets mostly gram-negative bacteria and one that targets mostly gram-positive bacteria. And we can see that treating the mice with antibiotics cured them from the glucose intolerance. We then went on to ask, okay, so which bacteria are involved? I'm moving to this side, I think. Um, and we, the first thing that we've done was to characterize uh, the composition of the microbiome. This was done by sequencing of the 16S gene. And we can see here in this PCOA plot, each dot represents the microbiome composition in one mouse. And we can see here in blue, the mice that were drinking saccharin for 11 weeks are distinct from all the controls and even from the microbiome composition of the same mice in the beginning of the experiment. We then went on to ask which bacteria are involved. The names are not really important, but we can see here that there's an increase, the ones in red here, in bacteria that, are be that belong to the genus Bacteroides, uh, some bacteria that belong to the order Clostridialis, and we see a reduction in different bacteria also from the order Clostridialis. But this does not still tell us if the microbiota is actually causing the glucose intolerance, or this is just um, a passenger effect. Maybe these mice became glucose intolerant by some other mechanism, and then because these mice are glucose intolerant, there's some change to the microbiota that is not causing the phenotype. So if you want to determine causation for the microbiome, you can do such an experiment in germ-free mice. Germ-free mice grow in these isolator, uh, isolators. They have no microbiome of their, of their own, no bacteria, no viruses, no fungi whatsoever. And then you can take microbiome from donors. In this case, donors drinking saccharin or donors drinking glucose. You purify the microbiome from their feces. You transplant the microbiome into the germ-free mouse, and you can wait for a few days, or no matter how long you want. And then you can see if just transferring the microbiome also transfers the phenotype. So this is what we wanted to do. After six days post-transplant, we performed a glucose tolerance test and also a microbiome analysis 
to see indeed that we transferred the microbiome that the donors had. And indeed, uh, the donors, the recipients of the microbiota from the mice drinking saccharin became glucose intolerant themselves. And it's important to note that these germ-free mice never saw saccharin or glucose in their drinking water. The only difference between these two groups is the microbiome that they have received. Another experiment that we've done to determine the role of the microbiota is to take uh, these germ-free mice, germ mice and, and colonize them. We just gave them bacteria of normal healthy mice and we had two groups, one that remained germ-free and one that are now colonized with bacteria. They have a normal microbiome and they were age matched, sex matched and of course mouse strain matched. And we repeated the experiment and we can see that if the mice don't have any microbiome of their own, no matter for how long we will feed them saccharin in their drinking water, they will never become glucose intolerant. This means that you have, the mouse has to have a microbiome in order to develop a sweetener-induced glucose intolerance. The next question that we wanted to ask is how is the microbiome may cause uh, glucose intolerance? So in addition to sequencing the 16S gene to determine the composition of the microbiome, we also performed a whole shotgun metagenomic sequencing to determine the entire genetic makeup of this uh, microbiome in mice drinking saccharin or mice drinking glucose. And you can see here in red uh, genes that went up in the relative abundance and green genes that went down in the relative abundance. And we divided these into three different groups. The first group of genes were genes involved in the degradation of glycans. Uh, increasing the degradation of glycans has been previously associated with increased capacity for energy harvest from the food, which may also uh, eventually lead to increased calories given to the host. Uh, we saw a, a, a large number of genes that belong to groups that were previously associated with obesity and diabetes in both mice and in humans. You can see them here. And lastly, we saw a group of genes that are involved in the degradation of heterocyclic compounds. This is, for example, saccharin. It is a heterocyclic compound. And this may suggest that this increase in the capacity to degrade heterocyclic compounds is indicative that this new microbiome induced by saccharin has the ability to degrade saccharin perhaps as an energy source. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into all the validations that we have done, but we have performed a metabolomic validation of the uh, end product of glycan degradation, which is short chain fatty acid, SFEA, SS, SCFA, and indeed we saw increase in short chain fatty acids. So the me mechanism that we have proposed is that saccharine consumption leads to dysbiosis, leads to uh, changes in the composition of the microbiome. The bugs that we saw that went up in the relative abundance, for example, bacteroides, are known to have enhanced glycan degradation capacity. This leads to enhanced levels of these uh, metabolites, short chain fatty acids, which are known to be, uh, the host may use them either as an energy source or for de novo glucose and lipid synthesis, which may very well explain the glucose intolerance, the intolerance that we have seen. And lastly, for this story, I would like to uh, relate to a very um, very small scale preliminary experiment that we have done in humans, only seven participants. We're not trying to claim anything broad or any, uh, I don't know, a global conclusion out of this experiment. This was done as a proof of concept experiment in which we took seven healthy, uh, normal weight, non diabetic participants that never consumed artificial sweeteners before, to the best of their knowledge. And we asked them for a duration of seven days to consume the maximal amount of saccharin uh, that a person can consume a day. And we monitor them daily for a glucose tolerance test. And we also sequence daily the microbiome of these participants. And interestingly, interestingly, we saw that we had a differential effect. In four of the participants, you can see here the glucose response in the first days of the experiment. And after four days of the experiment, we can see worsening of the glycemic response. This was evident in four out of the seven participants. This means that in humans, four out of the seven participants that we had, after consuming saccharin, had developed a poorer glycemic response. That is, this is quite similar to what we've seen in the mice. Uh, however, in three out of the seven participants, consuming saccharin had no such effect. You can also see it here for each participant uh, separately. These are the ones that were NR non-responding, and the red ones are responders, so each one, starting from day five, suddenly spiked in the glycemic response. And we went on to ask whether the microbiome is involved in this phenotype. <clears throat> so 
sorry. And we can see that even prior to the uh, appearance of, the, of uh, the differential phenotype, we were able to, de to determine which one will respond and which one will not respond to saccharin. Because you can see here in this PCOA plot um, that they are separated even prior to saccharin administration to responders and non-responders. But further so, uh, this is the microbiome of the non-responders from the first day of the experiment, you can see that even on the first day there are quite uh, different. This is just the various uh, bacterial odors uh, that are represented here by these different colors. And you can see that in the non-responders after seven days of saccharin, there is virtually no difference in the composition of the microbiota. But in the responders, not only were they different to begin with, consumption of saccharin actually induced changes to the microbiota. And finally, to conclude this story, we asked whether these changes are indeed uh, have a causative effect in glucose intolerance. We returned to this system of germ-free mice. This one may be a bit more complicated. I will slow down. And we took from, uh, this is a, an example of just one participant that was a responder and one participant that was a non-responder. We have repeated this for all of, all of our participants. And you can see that we, when we transplanted to a group of germ-free mice, the microbiome from the first day of the experiment, this is the glycemic response that the mice showed. And when we transplanted the microbiota from the last day of the experiment, which in the donor was associated with a poorer glycemic response, the mice showed the same. Also, the mice that received this new microbiome from the last day also had a poorer glycemic response. In the non-responders, first day, last day, looked the same. So to conclude this first story, uh, we've seen that consumption of non-caloric artificial sweeteners may induce glucose intolerance in mice and, as, and in a subset of humans. This is probably medi mediated by an initial difference in the composition of the microbiome and further changes to the microbiome. And we think that this is indicative uh, that humans feature a personalized response to non-caloric artificial sweeteners, probably stemming from the microbiome. So in the next story that I want to share with you, we actually wanted to tackle this question of personalized response to foods, not just to non-caloric artificial sweeteners, but to foods in general. And just to say that uh, we think that our small-scale human study is now uh, a good reason to perform large-scale studies uh, on the effects of non-caloric artificial sweeteners in humans in order to reach a more decisive conclusion on their effect in humans. Okay, so the next story that I want to share with you is what we called in our group the Personalized Nutrition Project. And in this uh, study, we, uh, we determined the response of humans, not just to artificial sweeteners, but to foods in general. And uh, so we talked before about the first recommendation that you will get from your dietitian or from your physician. If you want to lose weight, uh, don't eat sweets, take something non-caloric instead. Another very common diet that, you might, uh, that someone might recommend to you is uh, eat less carbohydrates or e eat food that have a low glycemic index. What does that mean? Eat foods that do not increase your blood sugar levels. So if, you want, if we want to maintain our health, we want foods that do not cause these spikes in blood glucose levels, and we want the increase and decrease in blood glucose levels to be as wide, as flat as possible. Uh, and we assume when we take into consideration the glycemic index that if I consume bread, if each one of you consumes bread in this room, we will have the same response. We will all have some kind of value that we can assign to bread, and then we can say bread is better than cookies, for example. Uh, but we know from preliminary uh, studies that were performed uh, prior to our study in uh, small-scale subsets of humans uh, that this is not the case, even for bread, uh, people demonstrate uh, variability in their blood glucose response to bread. But we wanted to not perform a study on four individuals, but rather on a thousand individuals. So what have we done in this experiment? For each participant, we sequence the composition of the microbiome. We perform blood tests to determine the levels of various uh, parameters related to blood. We performed uh, questionnaires related to food frequency, lifestyle, and medical questionnaires. We performed measurements of their body weight, height, waist circumference, waist-hip waist ratio, etc. And 
The main thing that we've done in this experiment is to perform a continuous glucose monitoring. So this was uh, used by a subcutaneous sensor. It was placed here, and it measured their blood glucose levels for one week every five minutes. So we had a lot of data regarding the changes in their blood glucose for a duration of a week. To correlate this with the things that these participants have eaten, uh, we asked them to use a smartphone-based app to log their food behavior, sleep, and physical activity. And in addition to their normal diet that they, uh, that they had for uh, lunch and for dinner, we also asked them in the morning to eat a standardized meal uh, so that we can compare between these participants. And we repeated this for 1,000 participants at the stage that I'm showing you now. This is an ongoing experiment. So the first thing that we've seen, even for these very simple meals of glucose, bread, bread and butter, or fructose, is there is significant variation between the participants in this experiment. You can see here, for example, for bread in green, people had either a very low response in terms of uh, uh, increase in blood uh, glucose. This is PPGRs for postprandial glycemic response. And some people had a, a high response to bread, and this is the same for glucose or for bread and butter. So you can see here, for example, for bread, just four participants, duplicates for each participant. You can see a participant that had a very high response to bread, a participant that had a very low response to bread. And this is not just due to the fact that some people just respond in a low increase to everything. Some people have a high response to bread and a low response to glucose, and some have exactly the opposite. So this can be seen here, but this is a bit more clear here. You can see just two participants, and you can see this participant had a high response to glucose, lower response to bread, and exactly the opposite for this participant. So if we take it another step forward to more uh, real-life meals, you can see that basically everything that we can consume, uh, cookies, bananas, apples, uh, rice crackers, cereals, no matter what, you can see here a very, very large variation in the uh, blood glucose response to basically everything that we eat. And you can see, for example, again, two participants. This one shows something that a physician today would uh, love to recommend. Uh, sorry, this one. Uh, this one, sorry. Uh, do not eat cookies because your blood glucose will spike, but you can eat a banana. Banana is OK. But actually, this one has a counterintuitive uh, effect to what we know today. Uh, cookies actually don't increase his blood glucose levels at all, whereas a banana is not the best food for this participant. And then we went on to ask what may explain these differences in the blood glucose response to the same food. And we can see here in yellow uh, parameters that are associated with a poor glycemic response. In blue, the ones that are actually uh, demonstrate a better glycemic response. And, so, and you can see here parameters that are uh, related to blood, for example, uh, glycosylated hemoglobin A1C. Um, uh, parameters that are, uh, that are related to the measurements, including BMI, of course, but also parameters that are related to the microbiome, the composition or the function of the microbiome uh, may explain the differences that we see in the differential glucose response to the same foods. And this is just one example of uh, high levels of the phylum actinobacteria uh, may explain the higher response to glucose or to bread. And this phylum was previously associated with a high fat and low fiber diet. And then we went on to ask, OK, can we take uh, this data and try to predict for each individual what should be the best diet for this uh, person? Um, can we tell them by the foods that they have eat eaten during this duration of one week, uh, what will be the response to foods that were not consumed? Can we just give them global recommendations for their entire life from this point on? So if you want to recommend a person uh, a diet today, what you will usually today do is just to measure uh, the carbohydrate uh, content of the meal. And you will say, OK, if there's a lot of carbohydrates in the meal, you will probably have a high glucose response. And this is, for example, how dietitians and physicians recommend how much insulin you should inject just by the content of the carbohydrates. And we can see that there's indeed a significant correlation between the contents of the carbohydrates and the increase in blood glucose, but it's a very poor correlation. If we take the contents of the carbohydrates and we add to this all the parameters that we've checked, including the microbiome parameters, we can actually significantly increase the correlation of the prediction of how high your blood glucose would increase. 
So we tested this on the same uh, cohort in which these data were derived from, on, on the 800 participants. And we further uh, tested this on, new, on a new cohort of 100 participants that did not participate in the original study. And we could actually predict for foods that were not consumed by these participants, what would be their blood glucose response uh, based on the entire parameters of in, including microbiota. And lastly, this is the, the last part of this story. We wanted to see whether we can actually recommend a, a diet uh, based on this prediction. So what we've done uh, is to take uh, this data and put them in an algorithm to try to predict uh, for 26 participants uh, two diets. We were uh, blinded and also the participants were blinded to these diets. They just received a list of foods they should eat in one week of the experiment and then a list of foods that they should eat in a different uh, week of the experiment. And one was supposed to uh, be a good diet that keeps their blood glucose low, and the other one was supposed to be a bad diet that will spike their blood glucose. And this was done solely by the prediction uh, derived from this algorithm. And indeed, we can see it for just this one participant, but this repeated for the entire 26 participants, that the diet that was supposed to be a bad diet caused a lot of spikes in blood glucose throughout the experiment, whereas the good diet indeed uh, kept them on a low, uh, normal, blood, uh, healthy blood glucose levels. And uh, perhaps surprisingly, you can see that foods that are in some person bad diet, for example, pizza is bad for this participant, but is actually good for this one, and the other way around for hummus, schnitzel, potatoes, uh, whatever. So there is no one diet that fits all. So just to conclude, I believe I have demonstrated that people have a highly variable post-meal glucose response to identical meals and that the microbiome is a major driver of these variations. And we think that due to that, current dietary guidelines that try to fit one diet to everyone uh, may induce actually a high glycemic response in many cases, and this might actually accelerate the metabolic disease that these diets are intended to treat. Uh, so we think it's important to integrate the personal parameters and the microbiome feature to allow a better prediction of what a person should eat. And with that, I would like to conclude. And this, uh, both these studies were done in a, collab in a collab close collaboration with a group of Iran Segal in the Computer Sciences Department in the Weizmann Institute. So I would like to thank the group of Iran Segal, our, collabor our collaborators in these two um, hospitals and in other groups in the Weizmann Institute and this amazing group that I am lucky to be a part of, the Elinav Group at Weizmann Institute. And thank you. Spasiba. I just uh, know about uh, one type of sugars uh, which uh, uh, do not uh, make uh, gly glycemic index high at all. Uh, they called fructans, uh, and uh, they contain uh, glucose and saccharose. But uh, in this molecule, uh, one of the bound uh, of this molecule is a better bound, like in cellulose. And uh, these sugars are so sweet like any sugars, but they don't uh, uh, increase any glycemic index and uh, don't... Uh, <coughs> so, uh, do, you know, uh, do you know about uh, this uh, type of... Uh, okay, okay, uh, of sugar, and uh, may, uh, maybe you can uh, uh, say something about them. Uh, are they are good for uh, human health? Uh, they contain in topinambur, I know, the one of the fruit uh, uh, where them are presented. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I think uh, fructans are now uh, mostly novel concept in diet, they are not still present in many uh, synthetic foods. Um, and I would like to answer your question in two manners. Uh, one is that indeed I still haven't heard of fructose, fructans inducing a glycemic response. That part is true. Uh, this doesn't mean that they don't do something again to the microbiome. To the best of my knowledge, there is still no study that demonstrates any effect of fructans and also a plethora of other sweeteners on the microbiome. For example, we still don't know uh, if stevia, for example, does something to the microbiome. Uh, so. The first part of my uh, response is they might do something uh, to the microbiome. This may in turn do something to the glycemic response to other foods. But the second part of uh, my response is that if uh, something in this, I learned from this research 
is that uh, we cannot really be certain that something does not elicit a glycemic response until we study a significant amount of human participants. Maybe uh, all the studies were, that were done up to this point just didn't pick up the ones that in these, these, these fructans would induce a glycemic response in. Um, so we still don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much.